I do think that there's like a little bit of a delay, so we'll give it a second. Oh yeah, awesome. Let's see here. Hello. Awesome, it's working, great. How's everybody doing? Doing good. good. Awesome, awesome. So uh, welcome to the Fusion 360 for Furniture Design and Manufacturing week-long webinar. Uh, basically what we're gonna do this week is we're gonna talk about how to deploy Fusion 360 in furniture design and manufacturing processes. Um, you know, I thought we'd start out with a little bit of introduction to who we are and then what we'll cover today. And then we're gonna hand it over to Jonathan to actually jump into Fusion 360 and go through what it would look like to take an idea all the way through to completion using some pretty basic to intermediate modeling and joint and, and parameters tools. And the, that will continue through the entire week. So we'll continue to build every day on what we talk about today. So be sure to you know, get in and participate all week long. So we'll cover today, those things that I mentioned. Tomorrow, we're gonna do a deep dive into parameters and how to use them in production so if you have clients or customers who want a range of different sizes, how can you optimize your design to actually be able to ship that quickly and easily? Day three, Wednesday, we're actually going to cover, um, we're going to cover T-splines and surfacing for organic modeling. And then on Thursday, we're going to take that organic stuff and we're going to actually show you how to machine it. And we're going to show you how to make custom tools and use our nesting and fabrication tools to actually panelize your designs. So if you're in the cabinet industry or if you're doing casework or anything like that, you know, how can you actually optimize your throughput to optimize your revenue? And then Friday, we're actually going to talk about all the ways you can collaborate Fusion 360 from file sharing to Fusion Teams. And we're also going to cover a little bit of drawing automation to actually help you push all of your stuff through to manufacturing. So today I'm joined by Brad Tallis and Jonathan Odom, and I'm Trent Still. My background is in architecture and advanced manufacturing, and I actually started a tech-enabled furniture business that essentially took consumer input data and turned it into automatic manufacturing process. So we could run a lights out furniture design and manufacturing company. The company is called Lahoma. It's based out of San Francisco. And I also work for Autodesk as a technical marketing manager. And I focus on industrial design, engineering, and how to use Fusion for your business. So I'm gonna go ahead and kick it over to Jonathan and have him give us a little bit of an update on himself and his background. And then we'll go to Brad and then Jonathan can take it away. Yeah, so I'm Jonathan Odom. Uh, my background is uh, pretty widespread. Um, I've worked in, I did film special effects, um, residential architecture, product design, uh, manufacturing, um, you name it. So pretty much anything having to do with making, I've, I've had something to do with it at some point. I'm a Fusion 360 community manager now, going on four years, and um, that means a lot of different things, but uh, one of the things is uh, doing webinars like this. So welcome, everybody. My name is Brad Tallis. Um, I do a lot of the uh, Fusion 360 live streams. Some of you may have seen me before. My, my background is started with Hewler Packard many, many years ago um, in the direct modeling side of things. Uh, worked for them for probably about 13 to 15 years. Um, and then PTC acquired our 3D CAD software. So I worked for PTC for about 13 years um, in federal aerospace and defense. Um, and then um, just this week is actually my six year anniversary with Autodesk. Um, my, my hobbies are woodworking. I love doing a lot of woodworking. In fact, I built my own CNC machine in the garage. Um, just to, to play with and um, make furniture. I've done a lot of stuff for the local schools. They, they hire me to build like podiums and stage sets and all that kind of stuff. So woodworking is one of my favorite hobbies along with like RC airplanes. And I even use the CNC machine to cut out, you know, RC airplane type stuff. So that's me in a nutshell. Awesome. Cool. Awesome. Super cool to hear everybody's background. Jonathan, just real quick, I want to um, say that if you have questions or for either Jonathan or myself or Brad, go ahead and put them in the chat. Brad and I were actually be in the chat answering them or, or sending you links to, to helpful articles or anything like that. 
The goal here is to truly just give you every resource that you ask for and full transparency. If we don't have it, we'll figure out how to get you something or we'll put it on our list of things that we need to make improvements on. Uh, so yeah, with that, Jonathan, why don't you go ahead and jump in and, and Brad and I'll talk to you in a bit. Okay. <clears throat> so I'm going to show you today how to uh, design and uh, make your own um, tapering jig, right? Uh, this is a hold down clamp. So I basically made a copy of this thing. Um, you know, I've got a table saw. I don't have a planer joiner. Um, this is a pretty good, you know, way to kind of get around that. And I like to make things and I didn't want to spend $89. So here we are. Um, I've got this, you know, nothing fancy, this kind of Lowe's generic cobalt um, contractor saw, uh, which is kind of where I started with it. Um, so I'll jump into Fusion and show you what we did. So um, this is the end product, right? You can see I've got some photos here. So it actually does work. Um, just did that this morning. Um, here's a top view. So MDF, um, I cut it out on my uh, Shapeoko CNC machine. Um, these are 3D printed uh, hold downs. Um, there, you can do a lot of things with 3D printing. We'll get into that a little bit here, but it's a it's a good um, shortcut to uh, you know making your own stuff. You can see some other 3D printed parts here, which I'll get into in a minute. Um, but you know it's pretty basic. It's got a channel there for these T T slot nuts. Um, it's got this uh, this feature right here that fits into that feature right there. Um, there's a handle, and then this thing adjusts, and each one of these dots represents one degree of, uh, of um, rotation, right? So starting out, we got this contractor saw. So basically all I did was really basically reverse engineered my, uh, my table saw, right? So I just took some measurements, took some pictures. Um, you don't need a whole lot of really detailed information. You basically just need to know this distance here, how wide this channel is, how deep it is, where the saw is located, that kind of stuff, right? So there's no need to model more than that. And then starting here, I bring that in and what I'll walk you through today is designing this part, right? So Fusion, you know, if you're not familiar, um, I'm going to start out with a new design there. You'll see this when you open Fusion yourself. It's the first thing you see. Um, I want to bring in this contractor saw and work off of that, right? It's going to be the, the best way to know that it's going to fit what I'm doing. So I'll start by saving this. Um, live demo. All your information is in the cloud in Fusion. Um, there's a cache that you have locally that keeps 25 designs. Um, and you can actually specify the stuff you want to keep local so you can work offline, but everything's connected to the cloud. So um, this is where you access all your data over here. You're not using your own file management system like within Finder or Windows or whatever. Um, it all happens here. So I've saved that. Now what I want to do is go to insert and then actually I can just do that from here. Go down here, right click, insert into current design. Click OK, it just comes in at the origin. And that's my starting point. So if you look back at the jig, um, I'm going to start with the base. And rule number one, when you're designing Infusion, which you'll learn if you start to get into this stuff, is create a new component. You always want to start there. And it's a good idea, it's a good habit to name stuff, especially if you're going to be working with other people. So I'm going to call this the base. Um, now I need to make a sketch. So you'll notice in Fusion that the way things are arranged in your toolbars up here is um, in, in a logical order that makes sense for most people. New component is the first thing you wanna do anytime you're making something new. Sketch is the basis of pretty much all your 3D geometry. You don't really use primitives that often. Um, and then extrude is the most common next feature you use. So it is pretty intuitive when you're learning this stuff. So I'll start by creating a sketch. And I'm just gonna pick this part of the top of the table saw, right? 
So now what it's done is taken me into the 2D environment. I'm in Sketch now. You can tell because it's moved me to the Sketch tab, and then I've got a different set of tools up here. The other way you can tell is you've got this big Finish Sketch button right there, and then this palette comes up. Um, so we'll walk you through a sketch now. So I, what I want to do is make the base just the length of the table saw. It doesn't really make any sense to make it longer than that, and anything shorter than that is just going to be less stable. So I'll just start there. And I'm just going to roughly draw a rectangle. I don't want to snap to anything just yet. I'm just going to draw a rectangle like that. Um, now, I need to make a decision about how wide it's going to be. And it looks to me like the most logical thing would be to go to this edge of the table right there. So I'm going to project some geometry from the table that I can snap to. I'll go to Create, Project, Include, Project. And I'll just click on this line over here, that edge, enter. You'll see now I've got a pink line. Pink means it's linked to 3D geometry that exists somewhere else. So I know I want that to be the edge of my base. So I'm going to go make a, make a constraint now, OK? So I'm going to make this point constrained to that point. Good. All right, now I'll make this point constrained to this point. Also good. And then I need to make a decision about where this line is going to be. I'll hit escape to get out of that tool, move it over and say, you know, it probably wants to be pretty close to that cavity next to the table, next to the blade. Um, you know, I, it might make sense to make it, to bring it further over in case I wanted to do like a dado or something. Um, but in this case, I think I'll just bring it over here because since it's made of MDF, I could always just cut part of it off, right? So now I'm going to give it a dimension here. Okay, it's metric, which is my default because I do a lot of 3D printing stuff. So I'm going to go over here to document settings and then units, change that to inch. And right here, it's telling me 8.289. Well, I don't want that, right? So let's make it 8.5, eight and a half inches. I'll zoom in and see that it comes right up to the edge of that cavity. And I think that's going to be okay. So I'm going to finish this sketch. And now I want to make 3D geometry out of it. Now, when you look at this jig, if you look at this part in particular, I'm going to isolate that. You'll notice that there's a lot of other stuff going on here. There's these slots that the you know the um, the uh, thumb screws go into and all that stuff. There's all these features on the bottom that make all this stuff work. It's a good rule of thumb to keep your sketches really simple and then add sketches to make new features later. It makes things perform faster. So what I'll do now is extrude. And then I'm just going to pick all of these profiles, right? I want to start with just this rectangular base. So I'm just going to click that once, then this, then this. So now I've got all those parts, right? Distance, I want it to be, the defaults are all fine there. I'm going to make it 0.75 because that's about how thick my, uh, my, my material is. OK, so that's my starting point. Now what I need to do is make some decisions about where I want these features to go, right? So if I look at this Rockler ta tapering jig here, kind of zoom in on that and see, and just get a feel for, okay, where did they put all these features? Where's that slot over here, right? That looks like it's about three inches. I'm going to assume this is good. I mean, this is a great, great company. They make really good stuff. So I'm just going to kind of, you know, eyeball this and get a reasonable facsimile of it, right? So it looks like about three inches from the ends right there. And yeah, I think I'll just go with that. So we'll go back here. And actually, the next thing I need to do is bring in a part that's going to give me, um, that's, that's going to make it possible for this thing to all clamp together. So I will go to Insert McMaster Car Component. And then I'm going to look at my cheat sheet over here. Where's my T slot nut? Grab that serial number. This works. It's just a window into McMaster Car, so you can search for stuff. But I know my serial number, so I'm just going to put that in. Click on product detail. This needs to be step. I'm going to download that. And then it comes in with uh, the y-axis up. Um, that's kind of the default for 3D stuff. I like mine with Z up because it makes more sense for CNC. So I'm going to rotate this 90 degrees. And I'll rotate this 90 degrees right there. And then click OK. I'm going to look at this from the top and say, OK. So now I can get a feel for 
where my slot's going to be located, what the what the dimensions of the slot need to be, and so on. So I brought this in. It's five sixteenths, right? That I just clicked on that and gave me this little heads up radius right there, which is 0.156. So I'll just, I'll just start with that to make my uh, to start cutting out my part here. So I'm going to click the top of this uh, this top face and then create sketch again. Um, I want to capture position here. It's going to always ask you to continue. Um, if I continue, you're going to notice that this rotated to its default position right there. I don't really want to do that. I want to keep it like that. So I'm going to do that again, create sketch right there, capture position, and you'll see that stayed in that orientation I gave it in the first place. That's a little confusing in the beginning when you're, you're not really used to fusion. Now I'm going to make some construction geometry. So I'll click a line here. This is going to give me uh, the basis for my slot that I'm going to make, right? Um, so I went point to point. If you hover over, you're going to see these little constraints show up. That's telling me it's constrained to this line. That right there tells me it's perpendicular to this one. So it's a good place to start. I'll make a dimension here like that. Let's make that three. That'll be my center line. Escape to get out of that. Then I'll go to create and I'll do a slot. I'm gonna do a center point slot. Go to the middle. That little triangle tells me it's the midpoint. Go over here, just sort of eyeball that and then make this five, oops, five sixteenths. Don't want that to actually be five sixteenths because that's gonna be a little too much friction, right? So let's actually make that five sixteenths plus uh, 0.04. It's a decent tolerance there. So it's a little bit bigger than that now. Um, and then, You'll notice that the lines change color when you start doing this stuff, right? So in this case, I've got black lines there. It tells me they're constrained, but I've also got these blue lines. They're blue because if I, I can pull them and move them, right? They don't actually have a real, um, you know, uh, placement within this, this whole object. It's really important to fully constrain all your sketches because if you want to change stuff later and you don't do that, things explode, right? So it's always a good rule of thumb. You want dimensions and constraints on everything. So for a dimension, I'll click on this point and this point. Let's make that 1.25. Okay. And then um, it's symmetrical. So I'm gonna have the same thing on the other side. So I'm gonna give myself another center line here. Escape. Then I'll just make a window on that and then mirror it. Select that mirror line to be here. Now I've got both of those. These lines are not gonna be part of the geometry I'm gonna extrude down to cut these slots out. So I'm gonna pick both of those holding shift. And then my shortcut for that is X. So now they're um, construction lines. What that means is when I click back on my solid tab and hit extrude pro tip with fusion, you don't actually have to finish the sketch. You don't actually have to finish the previous tool you were doing. You can click on the next one. It does all that automatically. It saves a lot of time in the long run. So you'll see when I pick these profiles now, um, I don't have to pick both sides of that line, right? So it's going to save me some time. And then for the distance, I want to pick uh, some other geometry to reference to. So I can orbit down and look at the bottom here and then just click on that face. It's going to cut through it by default, right? See, it says operation is cut. So that looks good. Click enter. There we have it. So now we're getting, we've got a, started with a slot here. Now, I want to make the rest of this geometry reference this, right? Because this is the thing that needs to be, um, needs to drive the rest of the geometry here. So, what I'll do now is uh, a joint. So I'm gonna start by making a joint and then kind of take it from there, right? So I will go click on my joint right here. And then first, any, anything you're doing in Fusion, by the way, if you just stop for a moment, stop moving your cursor, it's gonna tell you what it wants. So it's got this heads up display telling me, place joint, joint origin on a component. It has to be on a component, right? So, I'm gonna click on that and then I'll go over here and click on this. This is actually, will this work? 
Huh, yeah, I guess it does. Okay. Yeah, so by default, it wants to do a rotational joint. That's not what I want. I want a slider. And I don't want it in that axis. I want it in X axis, right? And I also don't want it obviously all the way at the top, right? I need to look over here and see how far down do I need to go? I think I can probably do a quarter of an inch because I think this thing is a half inch thick, but I'll go look from the side just to make sure I'm not getting some click on the little right side view cube thing, 0.25. And it looks, it's not poking down the bottom, so that's fine, I'm gonna stick with that. So that's an offset that starts this joint origin, right? Click OK. And then I'm going to do right click. So what this does, by the way, if you're not familiar with what's going on with joints, is I'll click that and then click Animate. And it makes a joint between those things. So I can preview how this thing is going to move in the real world. So I click OK, and I should be able to take that and move it. Click and pull. And it takes everything else with it. Why did it do that? Well, it's because this isn't grounded. So if I right click on that and ground, I should be able to take this and now I can move it and that other thing doesn't move. You always have to ground something in Fusion, okay? So that's gonna give me the geometry I need to make the cutout, the cutout shape that's required to make this thing, you know, to, to make the slot on the bottom. So to do that, I'm going to just hide my bodies here Click on this, create sketch, turn my bodies back on, create, project, include. I'm going to bring in 2D geometry from there, click that and enter, give myself a center line here, turn those bodies back off. So I'm going to use this geometry and mirror it to the other side, right? But remember, we, we've got tolerances to deal with here. You don't want it to be exactly this width. So what I'm going to do is that and that, that, just roughly sketching stuff out. You don't have to start by, you know, making everything uh, constrained and dimensioned and all that stuff. I find it's good to just kind of roughly sketch it so you can picture it and then move on from there. Click on that and then 0.04 is what I liked for my tolerance. Then actually that would be 0.02 because it's both sides, right? I want a total of 0.04. Then I'll click this, and then I'll just click on that one. I don't have to keep typing in 0.02. We're gonna get into parameters later, but that FX tells you that it's referencing a parameter. Every dimension you make in Fusion is, is a parameter. It shows up in a list. Okay, so all of these are based on that, what I made over there. So watch this. Let's say I wanna make it a little bigger, 0.03. They all go along for the ride. 0.02. Okay, and I'm going to make all of these lines that came in with it X for uh, construction lines because I don't want to have to pick all those little parts when I go and like cut this thing out, right? So I'll grab all of that, mirror this, and we got that. So I'm going to go back to sketch, finish sketch, and I will turn bodies back on. And I wanna see what the distance is between those, those two parts so I can make that same distance on the other side, right? We'll click on this face. And then I'm gonna go over here, put my cursor where I know that other face is, click and hold until I get to that profile, right? When you click and hold in Fusion, it uh, gives you a list of everything that's underneath the cursor. So it's a, it's a handy way to, you know, um, to see things and make, um, uh, you know, make, um, make changes, make geometry, measure things without having to turn things on and off, hide and show things in the browser over here. So that's 0.813. Um, I will go, let's see, I'm going to make a plane. Actually, I'm going to cancel that because I was, I was selecting something there. I don't want to do that. So I'll just make it the same one over here. Minus 0.813. And then I will take, turn that off, click and hold there, 
to get the profile. We'll shift, go over here, click and hold profile, extrude to this plane. Click OK. And I can turn that off. I don't need to see that anymore. So if I look on the underside now, I can turn off my table saw. Let's just get in the way. Now you can see I've got these troughs in here, right? Now, if you look at my model over here, you'll notice that it's got these dog bone cutouts in it. I did that because I made this thing on my CNC mill, right? Or my CNC router. Um, it's just an easy way to get square corners, you know? Um, I'm not gonna mess with that here, but you'd do that the same way. You'd make a little circle shape, you make a sketch, do a circle shape. There's also this plugin called dog bone, um, add-in actually is what we call them. And that uh, basically you can select edges and then tell it where you want a dog bone to be and tell it the diameter of your tools. That's pretty handy too. Okay, so that's, that's good. I've got those parts down there. Um, what's next? Let's take a look at this. Right, I need holes for uh, screws that are going to um, screw into the, uh, to the, that, um, the feature at the bottom. What did I call that feature? The miter bar, that's right. So the next thing to do probably is make the miter bar because that's gonna tell us where those screws need to go. So I'll turn the table saw back on and then I've got some um, 5 8 uh, um, Delrin that I'm gonna use for this. So I'll go back up to the top right there and I'm gonna make that miter bar keeping in mind the dimensions of the material I'm gonna use. So close down the base. And then I'll make a new component, miter bar. Um, funny story, as you can tell, probably tell here, this uh, trough for the miter bar is definitely not 0.75 inches. Um, I learned that the hard way <laughs> and had to actually uh, cut down this miter bar before I put the thing together. But just keep that in mind while we're looking here. I know some of you people are savvy and you caught that um, way too big. It's a pretty, it's a standard uh, feature, if I'm not mistaken, on table saws. Okay, so um, let's make that miter bar. So what I want to do now is, uh, once again, pick a, uh, pick a plane to make my sketch, right? In this case, I'm going to do it off of a construction plane, because if I do it off of this thing, it's going to give me a bunch of geometry I don't need. So I'll just show you another option for making uh, sketch planes. So make an offset plane. It's the first option there under construct. Click that plane, click OK. Go around to the top, click that plane, create sketch. And now I just want to project that geometry down there, right? So shortcut for that is P, click and hold until I get that face, enter. And once again, I don't want that whole width, right? I need to get my tolerance off of there. So I do an offset, uh, undo chain selection. I just want to offset from one side, 0.02, repeat, right click, repeat offset. Point oh, and actually, I'm gonna just do that default there, 0.02. And of course I could double click and do that. And it's driven by the other one now. Go back to solid, extrude, click and hold until I get that profile. It's pointing down, that's what I want. So I'll do five eighths, enter. Now I got a miter bar. Um, so the next step is to figure out where those holes want to do want to go, and um, I need to know how big those holes are based on the the material I'm going to use or the, the parts I'm going to use to make that work. So I will insert another McMaster car component here. Open miter bar, insert master car component, and then I'll go to my cheat sheet here. Product detail, 3D step is already there because I just brought it in. That's the one I want to use. Download that. Once again, I want to rotate this. Ready? Good. Okay, and then keeping in mind what this is. So I'm gonna go over here once again and try to figure out like 
all right, what, what size do I want this thing to be? So um, I'm using a trackpad to get around, by the way. Um, it's kind of odd. Most people don't do that. Most people have a mouse or a space mouse. My space mouse just isn't working right now for some reason. So um, you'll notice things start to slow down a little bit when you start to get really close. When that happens and I can't really zoom in anymore, I'm gonna pick a face and then click this little look at button there. And then it's really gonna zoom in. So it kind of resets your uh, point of view. You could think of it that way, right? What I wanna know now is what's the diameter of the hole I want. So I click that, that radius is 0.195. I um, want it to be a little bit smaller than that, right? So let's call it, let's call that radius 0.19. And then I need to decide where those screws are gonna go on here. So I'll turn the base off, make another sketch there, create sketch. Once again, capture position, because I like where that thing is. I'm gonna do a center line. So click on the midpoint, click on the midpoint there, escape. It's a center line, so I'll, I'll hit my shortcut X while it's selected, so it's a construction geometry. I'll make a circle there, 0.19 times two. Enter. Um, once again, it's blue telling you that you can move it. Don't want to do that. So it should be pretty close to the edge. Um, but I need to turn my base back on to make sure whatever I put here is not going to interfere with that hole, for example. So I'm going to do a dimension from this point to this point, eh, 1.5. Then I'll do another circle here, just kind of arbitrarily click on that. D for dimension, click again, want that to be the same. And then I'll do another, whoops, made it, wanted that to be perpendicular. So I click perpendicular constraint there because I want to select that, click that mirror button, click the select for mirror line, put it right there. Now it's symmetrical, right? Once again, black lines, you don't want to see anything but black pink or um, uh, like lines that you can't see basically that were projected from other geometry you used to start the, the project. So finish sketch, turn that base off. I don't need that right now. Extrude, click those three profiles. Rotate to the underside, sort of pan and zoom and click that face. So now I've got that. And let's go ahead and just make this model accurate, right? So I'll do, click on this thing. I like to do this, add an add a, uh, you know, identifier at the end of it because that serial number doesn't mean anything to me and it makes it easier to kind of, you know, navigate stuff. So I'll make a joint. Once again, Heads up display tells me what it wants. It's a first reference point. I just clicked that, that ring over there. Um, click this face. I want that to be a rigid joint under motion. Click OK. Control C, Control V, Enter. I can turn that one off. And then once again, I can do another joint. So I'll click on the top face, turn off the bodies for a second, just so I know what I'm picking. Bodies back on. Put that over here and you get the idea. So you could put a third one in there. Um, you really only need one, you know, just, just because you, um, you need, kind of need to see maybe where like, uh, where a screw comes in or, um, you know, get a feel for whether or not you have enough tolerance there for the thing to, to press in that sort of thing. Um, okay, and then I'm gonna go back up here, turn this on and um, I'm gonna kind of keep doing Actually, this doesn't need to move at all, so we'll, we're fine there. So my miter bar is in. Now I just need to go to my base and put those holes in. So once again, create sketch on the top. Open base, turn off bodies. I can go P for project, and I can just click the top of that miter bar, enter, and turn off the miter bar. And now you'll see I've got uh, basically reference points for the, um, for the screws to go through. Um, this hole is bigger than the uh, diameter of the screw. Uh, I know there's tolerance there, so it's probably okay. I think I'm just gonna go with the size of those holes. I could give it specific 
you know, diameters if I wanted to, but I don't think I really need to do that. So turn that on, miter bar back on. Um, I'm going to solid extrude and I'll pick those three profiles, turn the base back on, and then I need a reference, right? So I'll click and hold until I get the bottom face of my um, base. Click that, and you'll see it's cutting by default. Just a note on that, um, under operations, Fusion is gonna make assumptions about what you're trying to do, right? So if it's going, if the geometry is going through something, it thinks I wanna cut. If I were to, for example, pull this arrow in the other direction, it by default thinks I wanna join because the, the face of that, that profile is, um, is coincident with the face of the body, right? So it just thinks that is, you know, that, that by default. These are the three Boolean operations, join, cut, and intersect. You can also make a new body. You could also make them all new components, but that's not what I wanna do, right? I wanna go down here, click and hold, so I get the face of that, and then leave that default. Now I've got those. Okay, now I need screws, right? Obviously they need to be uh, countersunk. I'm gonna click that and click this and see, okay, 1.375, so it's one and three eighths. One and a quarter ought to do it. So um, now I'm gonna insert some screws, okay? Um, the screws could be really an either component. I like to kind of nest components with, um, with like inserted McMaster car components. It's just kind of how I like to organize things. So I'm gonna stay in the base for now and then I'll go insert McMaster car component. And let's find my screw. Didn't bring in the screws. Okay, so I'll show you how you search. Click on that inch, just narrowing down here. Those were 5 sixteenths, 18. Or sorry, it's five eighths, 18. Wait a minute. I think I did five sixteenths, right? Bear with me a second here. Yeah, five sixteenths, 18. Okay, insert. Master car component, screws and bolts, inch, five sixteenths, 18, one and a quarter, I need a flat head, Phillips to make my life easier, and then eh, 82 for the countersink angle, that's fine. So this ought to do it. Product detail, 3D step is good, download that. This one comes in with uh, the Z up. That's just kind of an anomaly there. Click OK. Then I'm going to do another joint to put this in its right spot. So click joint, top of this, top of that. And rigid is good. Click OK. And then that's going to give me uh, the geometry I need to make the, uh, the countersink, right? So um, I need to look at this in section, right, from the side. So I'm going to go to the inspect tool and kind of give you a little preview of that. So if I go click that and then section analysis, this is a pretty useful tool. You click on a face and then move that plane through, and then you can see what you've got there, right? So it shows you interferences. It shows you where things are touching. Um, handy tool for that. So we're going to kind of make a plane where, where that was. So I will go to uh, construct. Now I need an axis. So I'm just gonna move my cursor over here. That cylinder is fine. Click okay. Construct plane at angle. Click this one. I want that to be 90 degrees because I wanna see all three of these, right? Click okay. And then I will click on this plane, make a sketch. I for intersect, that's under the create menu right there. And then for the filter, I want to select bodies. I'll click on this, enter. Turn the bodies off so I can see a little better. And now I'm seeing where those things intersected. So I can see all that stuff, right? This is my 
got my tolerances there. There's my cavity for this thing. Now what I need to do is bring in the um, the shape of this uh, this um, screw head, right? So create, once again, I'll do I for intersect. I don't want a body this time. I want just this uh, specified entity there. I want this face, right? Click OK. And I've got a nice uh, triangle shape there I can use to make use another tool called Revolve, which we'll get into in a second, um, to make my cutout for this thing. Um, once again, I want a tolerance here, a little bit down, rough sketch like that, right? Parallel this to this, make a dimension there, 0.02. So half that tolerance I've been using. Right click, I click on this, whoops, escape to get out of the dimension tool. Click on that and then X for construction line because all I want is this profile, right? So that's that's what I need to make this thing. So click on that. And now I'm gonna do a revolve. And I've got the profile selected. So now it's asking me for an axis. I've got this axis right here. And the total is 360. I've got to turn bodies back on to see it. And it wants to cut through everything, right? I don't want to do that because I actually just want to use that geometry to make the cuts out of the other two holes. So click on this and do new body. Click OK. And then I'm going to do a right there. Hmm, is this going to give me trouble later? Yeah, it will. Anyway, this is just, this is for the sake of time. This isn't the best way to do this, what I'm about to do, because it's not going to make parametric connections. But for the sake of time, I'll just kind of do it, uh, do it rough here. So um, I pasted, I copy, paste that, enter, click on that, and then M for move. And I'll just do point to point. So click on this point, and then this one here. V for another paste, command V, point to point. So click on that point there, and this over here, enter. And then I'm gonna combine. So that's in my modify menu up here. Click that, turn off this screw. I don't want that getting in my way. I'm gonna click all three of those. By default, it wants to join them, but I wanna cut them. So we've just cut those out to countersink those holes. Now there's more than one way to skin a cat. There's a hole tool here, right? So I could I could go hole, click the top, move this thing over wherever that point is. I could give it a countersink. I can tell it, yeah, 82 degrees. I can tell at the top, like I can get all this information from that screw and make holes that are attached to different points. You know, I can place them in multiple points based on a sketch. So this is just another tool you can use. But um, if you're thinking in terms of, you know, sketching and uh, extrusions and stuff like that, um, that's the other way to do that. Okay, so we should be good with that. Um, how are we doing on time, 11.42? Okay, uh, and then the next thing is, so this is actually kind of interesting. Um, if you look at this tapering jig, one of the cool features it has is these, these holes, these little dots. Each one of those represents one degree of, uh, of, you know, of uh, rotation, right? So if you're aligned with this dot and that dot over here, and there's four dots in between them, you know you've got a four degree angle, right? So I'm going to do that here uh, on the top. So I will go create sketch on the top. I need um, a line that gives me like a reference for those. So I will go O for offset. That's this command right here. Click that. I've got chain selection turned off. That's what I want. And then minus 0.5. It doesn't need to be that far from the edge because these are just little, little dots. And then I will go down here, same thing, L for line right there. D for dimension, click those two, click on this. That's odd, double click that, click this, enter. Sometimes it wants a space after it. There's a little bug there, it's a little weird, but space after that reference and there it is. Um, Weird, why does that say 0.58? I think we found a bug. Okay, I'm gonna make that 0.5. Okay, um, then I'm gonna do a point. Click there and point. 
surface. I'll give that a real dimension from the edge. So D for dimension from there to there, uh, maybe 0.25. These are gonna be very small dots, so it doesn't need to be that close. Then I'll do another point here somewhere arbitrarily, right? I'll do a line from this point to this point and then D for dimension. And then this needs to be 89 degrees, right? So that tells me it's one degree off from the other edge, okay? So if I go down here, create another point. Also 0.25. Um, and then I wanna give myself like a reasonable dimension between those, right? So basically what I'll do now is Take this and this and go create rectangular pattern direction Click on this. Move that little arrow. And I, what I want is spacing. I want the space to be, um, yeah, minus one is good. And then click that quantity and it just keeps going up, right? So each one of those dots is giving me that one degree angle, right? Click OK. And then, yeah, and then I'll keep this dot right here as a, as a reference, I guess, for straight. Would I need to do that? Yeah, yeah, because you might want a straight one right at, right at the edge, I guess. Might as well. But anyway, each one of these is a, is a degree of, uh, of incline. So finish sketch. All right, now I'm going to use that whole tool again to give myself these just these really shallow, um, you know, uh, kisses from a uh, from a chamfer um, end mill. So go create hole, and then um, I want to do placement on multiple points, right? So I click all of these. Before I start getting into that, though, it's like this is obviously ridiculous. It's this huge hole. So first of all. My depth is going to be like 0.02 or something, really, really shallow. The width of this is, so my chamfer in mill is 90. Uh, the width of this thing is like 3 eighths. And then my depth is not even 0.02. It's probably like, ah, I got stuck in this thing. Hey, Jonathan. Yep. Just a heads up on time. We're at about 15 minutes left and want to make sure we cover a little bit of parameters too. So, okay. Um, yeah. So let's just do this thing here. I'm going to create, modify, sorry, create hole. And I'll just kind of show you what this would look like. We don't need to get into the whole thing, but you know, you place it there, sorry, on a point, right? Um, that depth is going to be like, 0.02, width of this is 3 eighths, three eighths. that's going to be 90, and then maybe like add another zero to that, super shallow. Yeah, okay, so this is the wrong tool for that because it's wanting to get that, that end, it's got a different different parameter for that. So anyway, to make that little that little um, divot, you do the same thing you did here, right? You make a little cone shape and profile and revolve it, and that's how you end up with the, the holes I made for this thing. All right, let's move on from there. Turn this off. Now I'm gonna make the, um, the, uh, the fence. So back to the top component. Create component here, fence on top, I do a rectangle like this, click point to point, it's gonna, you know, make those um, constrained, and then I'll do a dimension here, that's gonna be three. I'm gonna do a L for line down the middle, X, create slot, overall slot like that. Sorry, create slot center point. 
get here. I'll go back to click this and this, and that's 0.353. Actually, I can do a driven dimension there. So I'm gonna make this the same like that. It's telling me it's over constrained, doesn't matter because I'm just gonna use that to drive this dimension here. Click this, there you have it. And then once again, I need a dimension from just one end. I don't need both ends. Finish sketch, extrude. Click all my little profiles there. 0.75. Yep, okay. And then I'm gonna bring in this, uh, copy paste, turn off the base. Another joint. I'm just repeating the steps I did in the first place over there. To there. I want to rotate this 90. Oops, sorry, that's an offset. I want that to be zero. Offset should be 0.25, just like the other one. Motion needs to be slider. And I want that going in the Y axis. Click OK. Um, click and hold to see. Click and hold to get that face so I can measure the end. 1.063. I want it to be symmetrical, right? So I'll do this. I'm not gonna get into that tolerance stuff again here because um, you've already seen that. So what I'll do is just click this face. Actually, don't need to do that at all. I can just extrude, click and hold till I get that face. Click that over there. Under objects to cut, I wanna turn off that nut because I wanna keep that. And now I've got the geometry I need for this to work. And then turn this on. And what we need to do now is make a joint between between these two, right? So I can click this thing and just move it around arbitrarily. But what I need to do is give it a um, a planar uh, joint, right? So if I click that and go to the bottom here, I'm going to click, um, yeah, it wants that part, and then I do this part, pretty much anywhere, and then motion will be planar. And I want to flip that to the top. Click OK. And you'll see that I can just move this all around now. All right. um, and then to get into the joints, I'll just move back over to my finished product here. But if I unisolate this, you'll see that I brought in all these other components, right? Um, the thumb screws, the T-nuts are already there, the washers, all that stuff is here. Um, the joints that you make between these parts um, create relationships that uh, you know, are dependent on each other. So I can actually move this thing in the way that it would really move and get a sense of what it's gonna, how it's gonna work in real life. So if I click this handle here and rotate it, you'll see, okay, it's kind of doing, I get a rotational feel right there. If I click and hold until I get the, um, Probably just grab that part in there, be under the fence. And then just kind of move that. You'll see how it moves in that direction. So you'll notice that the other thumb screw there, the one that's on, on the top of the fence, um, is, is moving constrained to the um, that slot, right? So when we started out and made these joints, um, that created the geometry but it also creates these dependencies between these things. So very useful to be able to see like how this thing is really gonna move. You can, you, this, is, this is literally how this works, right? Um, if, you, if you do this stuff right, that's, that's what you get. So um, yeah, so that's pretty much um, the design and the mechanics of it. And now to get back into parameters, um, this is a really critical thing for, uh, for, for woodworking. Um, if you make like, so you all know that, uh, the thicknesses of plywood, for example, are never the same, right? 
we think it's 0.75, but a different batch is off by a 32nd or even a 16th sometimes, depending on what you've got. So like I said, everything I did, every single um, dimension, all the dependencies, all that stuff is, um, it shows up in here, right? So that's my planar uh, joint. I go to the base here. Let's look at this sketch, linear dimension. That's the width of my base, right? If I want to, I, really the way the way I designed this before I, you know, kind of did, did this whole demo was I put these things in the beginning because I knew what I wanted, right? I knew what the dimensions were going to be, the, the overall stuff. So what I can do here is I'm going to say, okay, width, and then that's 8.5. Go to D1. Instead of D1, it's, or instead of expression, it's width. Enter. So nothing changed there, but watch this. Let's say I want to make, I decide this actually needs to be nine inches. Enter. You'll see it moved off the edge, right? How about 10? The other thing you notice is that the end of that slot also went along with it. And the reason for that is when I made that, um, let's see if I can find it in here. Extrude to, there somewhere in here, there's a, you know, we don't really have to, you know, hunt it down right now. But when you when I made that offset plane to give it an end to extrude to, um, that was dependent on the edge of this body, right? So when I make this change here, it goes along for the ride. It keeps that dependency. Um, how about thickness? Like what if I were to go in the beginning here and say, okay, so that's extrude number one is this. Well, that's the thickness of it. So I'm gonna go MDF. 0.75, click on that, MDF, right? I'm, I'm making a dependency on this user parameter. Click enter. You didn't see any change because I didn't change anything, right? Now, if I go down to the fence, to this extrude, once again, that needs to be MDF. Click somewhere else. Now let's see if I did everything right and it actually works. So how about 0.8, enter. And you'll notice that all of those things stayed dependent on each other, right? Even though I made it thicker, it's the, their, um, the planar uh, surface is sticking together. Um, the, the, you'll, you'll also notice that if I look, click OK, and I'm going to go inspect section analysis right there, move it through, and you'll see this thing, right? If I look at this from the side, and I go right here and I say change parameters and I'm gonna make this um, 0.8. You'll see that once again, remember we moved this down by uh, a quarter of an inch when we made that joint. Um, it keeps that dependency, right? It's that the sketch I made makes that assumption. It's like, okay, well this, this part is dependent on this via a joint and it's offset by a quarter of an inch. So when I make this thicker, Fusion knows that, okay, it's, I saw that sketch. It's based on this thing. This thing moves according, in a, you know, in, in a you know, quarter inch relationship to the top surface of the base. So I know that's always gonna be there. I'm always gonna have that quarter of an inch no matter what I make this with. Um, you know, the same thing comes down to length and so on. Another thing you can do with parameters, which I'm sure um, Brad will get into tomorrow is you can make uh, formulas out of this stuff, right? And you can say, okay, that's 0.75. You know, maybe somewhere in here I did a sketch where it's a quarter of an inch. Try to find some place where I've got sketch revolve. Inch and a half right there. Maybe I want that to be thickness times two. I'm oh, sorry, MDF times two. That's going to give me that same dimension, but if I look over here and say, okay, let's make, let's, let's make this thing out of one inch MDF. Go up to the top, let's make that one. You'll notice that this went quite a bit further in, right? The, the edge of that slot right there, 0.75 tab. See, it's, it's keeping a relationship there. And that stuff gets really important when you're starting to you know, if you want to make something, you want to make a piece of furniture that's um, that's parametric and that like 
you know, um, you, you really thought about how you engineered this thing and you've got, you know, um, you want to make sure you've got enough material on the end of something to make a good structural connection. Um, I do that quite a bit. And you can also, I mean, I know um, uh, Trent does this in all of his work, but um, those dependencies are, are really powerful. And this is, you, there's a whole lot you can do with parameters. Yeah, so, I think that's actually a great opportunity to kind of transition into a little bit of a Q&A and talk about what we're going to uh, cover tomorrow and and Brad will be hosting that. So Jonathan, maybe if you want to quit sharing, we can kind of field some questions from the group live if you want. Uh, if anybody has any questions, we can kind of keep an eye on the chat and, and field them live. But I will say, like Jonathan mentioned it, so anytime you're doing parameters, in regards to production, it's a lifesaver, but it's also, it's not only a time saver, it's a labor saver and it's a, it's a revenue generator. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of Lahoma Furniture's like primary things is to be able to offer customization to every customer. But in order to do that, we have to be able to make our process so efficient that our labor rates don't run through the roof and waste doesn't run through the roof. So parameters is something that we've built an entire business off of to the point where, you know, we'll, we'll talk about it tomorrow, but we have one credenza that we can change number of drawers, um, you know, height, thicknesses of materials, lengths, widths, but also all of our, so we do all of our own manufacturing in house, including turning work. And so anytime that we change one of those parameters in the placement of some of our, you know, turned details, those automatically update too. So it's, it's much more um, complex than I think a lot of people realize. And, you know, some of the questions we saw about reference dimensions and equations and things like that, you know, one of the things that we just came out with last month actually makes making a per parametrically confined reference dimension in Canvas, not in the parameters dialog box possible, which just totally saves your workflow. So a lot of cool stuff tomorrow. Brad, do you have anything you want to say about parameters? I'll, I'll look to see if there's any some any questions. Yeah, I was going to say, um, basically, that's what I'm going to show tomorrow is we're going to kind of go deeper into parameters. And a prime example is like, let's say you're a cabinet company and you make built-ins and you go into a house and you're expecting the width to be, you know, 24 inches, but in reality, it's 23 and a half inches or whatever. You don't want to go and remodel all of your stuff and create new cut sheets and all that kind of stuff. You can just change one of those parameters. And I'm going to show some of those tips tomorrow. I saw somebody asking questions about like tolerancing, like Jonathan mentioned, like a dado groove and like what, what happens if, you know, you do a half inch dado groove and the plywood you get is 0.51 or whatever. You can program all that in as um, parameters and you make one little change like Jonathan showed at the end and everything was updating. Um, Boom. I mean, what blows me away is, you know, Jonathan was teaching today. If he was to sit down and design that jig, he could probably finish that whole jig in probably about 30 minutes. So yeah. 30 minutes of his time. And he now has a custom jig that he can use. He didn't have to spend 90 bucks for. And maybe it is just for a one-off design. Maybe it's for that one table that a customer asked for, because he typically doesn't do, you know, tapered legs or whatever. But you know, half an hour, he's cutting it on his CNC machine and, and videotaping it this morning. I thought that was really cool, Jonathan. So thanks for sharing that. Yeah. And Jonathan yeah, also shared some really cool tips. Hopefully you guys captured some of those tips. For example, section view, I use that all the time to see what's going on inside my design. Really cool tip. Um, you know, the clicking and holding to probe through instead of having to rotate and turn parts on and off. I'm hoping a lot of you guys picked up on some of those tips because it really does speed up the workflow. Um, also, the fact that he used components for everything. That's a huge one. Yeah. Um, you know, instead totally. of always trying to get used to creating everything as components, it'll just it'll make it easier to find things down the road. So great yeah. job, Jonathan. I'm seeing actually in some chat, yeah, there was a really good question about exporting and importing parameters uh, and everyone's answer. I see that uh, Peter and uh, Athan, Athan, sorry if I'm getting the name wrong, but total 100%, you know, uh, parameter IO, really good plugin. I mean, that's one of the things that I like about Fusion is that there are plugins, there are add-ins, there's this like ongoing thing. You know, at the end of the day, we can't make every solution possible, but it's so cool to see the community like, come in and say, hey, I, I have this workflow. You know, Bomber is a good ex example of that. You've got these, you know, bill of material companies who are starting to make plugins. So super rad. 
Um, you know, one thing that I, I will call out is that like the thing about Jonathan's project today is, you know, a lot of us start out as hobbyists. Like you start out because you're passionate about something and maybe you need a taper jig and truth be told, maybe you just can't afford the Rockler taper, taper jig. Right. And so you go out and you figure out how to make it. So you end up making it. I know so many businesses who started that way, who needed something, couldn't necessarily afford it. So they made their own version and then they started selling it. Um, you know, I think Portland is actually a perfect example of a community in general doing that. Like you see so many people in Portland, uh, Oregon and the United States kind of finding things they're interested in and, and parameters and the tools that Fusion have has an opportunity to turn your hobby into a business. And I think at the end of the day, that might, you know, that's maybe your cup of tea or not your cup of tea. For me, it's definitely something that I, I always look for is like, how can I turn my passion into to something that I do every day? So hopefully some of you might be in that boat and this week you get to see some of those workflows um, or maybe some of you already passed that and you already have your business and hopefully you still find really good things here. Um, I actually a really good question from Jonathan Rothman that just came in. He says, Jonathan, would you be able to share what your pre-work looks like? I'd be, it'd be great to see what and how much you've planned before you start working in CAD software. So maybe it's like a little bit of a conversation about what we do before we actually get into the, to the modeling part of it. Yeah, for sure. Um, so first step is to measure everything, right? <laughs> So um, this is how I measure stuff. I, I get a tape measure and I take a picture. So it makes it really easy to reference things. Um, you know, as you can see, this isn't gonna be terribly precise, but knowing that this was made in the USA, it's like, all right, well, that, that's gotta be seven and a half. I know the width of this feature and so on. Um, kind of work from there. Um, you know, tw 21, give or take, it's got a chamfer on the end. Um, calipers, like this is, you know, your best friend. Um, and then, you know, a, a big part of it is just kind of um, figuring out, I mean, this is really how I start. I have, I start with parameters, right? So before I do anything, I say, okay, I know I'm gonna have a thickness parameter. I know there's a length and a width. I know there's a fence that's got a separate width. There's a screw hole. It's like, okay, what kind of screws am I gonna use? What hardware do I have in my garage, right? Do I have, you know, I know I've got these um, 5 16 uh, 18 screws and inserts and stuff like that. I don't want to spend any more money than I need to. So, you know, um, all of this stuff start is, is the beginning of it. And then quarter end mill, that gets into, I can share that part too, but all of this is, you know, CNC machined. So knowing that, okay, I'm probably going to use a quarter end mill on a lot of this because there's stuff that's kind of within that, um, you know, within that width. But um, yeah, so... I hope that answers the question. Yeah, no, I think it's good. I think it, I think it hits on the point of like, you know, th there's a lot of like colloquialism, colloquialisms, like, you know, you know, proper project management or, you know, piss poor planning on my, you know, all these things. Like, I think that's the truth, right? Is that like anything that's ever been engineered or manufactured uh, outside of the occasional like novel idea, you've got to just kind of almost re-engineer things that, are in front of you right and you also have to know what your work like envelope is and i think jonathan when he designs this he designs it for his you know little contractor saw and is i think you said it was a shape oko um actually i remember when you built that thing yeah it is a shape oko uh, but but you know like for me when i design stuff i'm designing things for you know haas automation stuff or you know laguna has a great cnc line called their smart shops you know, we're designing for that stuff with like vacuum beds or, you know, fourth axis things. So you kind of just have to take a, a realistic look at, at what your available tools are and, and design and confine yourself within that with a little bit of openness to continue to expand, right? Because no one wants to be pigeonholed in a box. So I think when the cool thing about like Shape Oco as a tool, and someone was saying it earlier in the chat, like it's an awesome tool. It's such a good stepping stone because the fundamentals of how you would design for a Shape Oco are pretty much the same if you went to like a DMS five axis router, right? Like until you get into multi-axis or tilt axis or turning, a lot of those fundamentals, you can start with hobbyist machines. And that's one of the things I like about 3D printing so much is that like, it's really started to give people the vernacular in talking about automation, right? Like when you start to design, we, we said it earlier, there's a really good, like a really good term, you know, it's like design for manufacturing, DFM in the industrial design industry, like is a big thing. 
But one thing that's happening now, especially in San Francisco startups is design for McMaster car, right? So you have this catalog at your fingertips and you say, I'm going to use that hardware. I'm going to design around that hardware. So I think it's just taking like a realistic look at your capabilities and your tool set and then giving yourself enough opportunity to like explore and invent, but also being grounded in reality. So um, note on that one. Yeah, please. So uh, I was putting this thing together last night and I realized that I didn't actually, my McMaster car order didn't include these T-slot nuts, right? So I was like, oh crap, I got to, what am I going to do, right? So what I did was brought that part into another file, roughly used the dimensions of it, and then just added some nuts I knew I had. That's awesome. So then <laughs> I 3D printed those along with these clamps, and you can see them right there. That's awesome. Yeah. So can you, you show know. the video of you using it one last time? Cause I think that that's such a perfect way to end this. Yeah. Like you actually did it. That's rad. Yeah. Sweet. Need, well, know, yeah, that was awesome. Yeah. Um, all right, everybody. Well, we're at time. We're a little bit over. Um, I want to just say thanks for everybody who joined. It looked like at, we had about a hundred folks uh, in the whole time asking questions and show up tomorrow. They're all at the same time. It's 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. So whatever time that is for you, I have no idea. Um, but show up, ask questions. I'll be here all week. Brad and Jonathan will be with us tomorrow. And then Wednesday, we're doing, um, you know, really organic surface modeling in furniture. And that will be with Kaching Song and Alex Lobos. And then a lot of questions came up today around like complex manufacturing opportunities in Fusion 360s. We'll cover that on Thursday. And that's actually gonna be our biggest group. We've got four people from the manufacturing division who are gonna talk about creating your own custom tools, nesting and fabrication, custom work holding, I'll be on too, fielding any questions. And then uh, Friday, it'll be us three back again. And we'll start to synthesize all of this into like how do you actually ship a business using Fusion 360 with some of the collaboration tools and drawing automations? Which I saw some questions come up around drawings. It's a totally slept on feature in Fusion, and it's one that I'm super pumped about. So I hope you all can, can take some really good kernels away from that. So with that, you know, Brad, Jonathan, thanks for showing up. Thanks for being awesome. Everyone who watched today, thanks so much for showing up and, and participating. And uh, we'll catch you next time. Thanks, everybody. See y'all. Bye. Thanks, everybody.